ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to another episode of Two Strike Noise, your weekly baseball history podcast. My name is Jeff. I'm half of the show. The other 51.2% is uh, Mark A. Johnston joining us from the PNW. Mark. Happy, happy World Series time. Yeah. Yeah. Who, by the time this by the time this episode drops, it could be over, but. It, it could be, but you know, and I, I, I don't count the Yankees out. I'm not a Yankees fan, but I've learned not, not to count them out. So by the time this plays, this is going to sound dumb because the Dodgers will have won. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm screwed either way. Well, I don't know. I mean, the Yankees, these games at Yankee Stadium, it's the Dodgers versus the entire stadium. I mean, ripping balls out of gloves. Yeah. and We've seen this, yeah. Yeah, I was just watching an interview, and they were showing that from game four where the idiot fans ripped the ball out of Mookie Betts glove in the stands and they were for some reason interviewing Rob Gronkowski Gronk about this baseball thing and Gronk is like hold up he's like I know that guy I went to school with him (laughs) he was a (laughs) hockey player and he was crazy and that's hilarious he still is he's apparently been barred from game five as well which yeah that's there's no room for that I mean you know, to try and maybe make him miss it if it's in the stands. But he just, he grabbed right. it and his friend was trying to swat Mookie's hand away. Oh, yeah. That, that, that's way over the top. Yeah. I agree. I couldn't agree more. That's not cool. Yeah, let's not do that. You know, uh, if a ball's coming into the stands and the opposing team is coming over, they got a shot to catch it and you can swat it away, as long as you're not reaching out of the field, I feel like that's part of the game. Yeah, I mean, Jeffrey Mayer got away with it, but since then, they've been pretty on top of that to keep that from happening. Yeah. And I'm glad they called him out. It's a good thing. But I was very bummed last, uh, we're recording this on Wednesday, I was bummed on Tuesday night because I was thinking, oh, this could be the last baseball game of the year. I, yeah. I'm rooting for the Yankees, but I could really care. I'm rooting more for the diamond to open up and swallow both teams more than anything. But <laughs> no, no, uh, Dodgers, Yankees fans. He didn't mean that. No, I know. I totally did. But I just don't want the baseball season to be over with. Like if, the, if the Arizona Fall League was on TV more, if it was easier to get the uh, Dominican League games, any of that stuff the the uh, Japanese series is going on right now. Haven't seen any of it. I, I all I get is the score after it's done. And what about uh, the uh, the new league in in uh, India and uh, the Arabian yeah, Coast? I'm, I, I, I'm waiting for their their next game. I'm, I'm not holding my breath. You know, I got the phone number of the president of the yeah, league. Yeah, I know he wanted to talk to us, but they had two games and that's been it. And I have not heard a single thing since then. Uh, I, I heard from his assistant. I mean, it sounds like he'd be willing to come on the show if Was, people wanted. Is it. this the assistant to the traveling secretary or the assistant to the regional manager? Yeah, I can't remember what his last name was. Costanza. Oh, well, hey, let's talk about. We're in BP, by the way. We we've just we don't even mention it anymore because uh, most no, stands, just, uh, most stadiums don't even have the public in when BP starts. So we well, and and we're kind of a free form podcast these days <laughs> yes well uh, speaking of yankee fans i got something for you maybe this will make up for my indiscretion there a minute ago saying hoping they get swallowed up by the the earth the new york yankees major league baseball and ralph lauren have combined for a line of yankee paraphernalia wow so you can get this. I am looking at it right now on uh, MLBshop.com. You can get a men's New York Yankee polo, Ralph Lauren navy wool pullover sweater for the friendly fan friendly price of one thousand one hundred ninety eight dollars. <laughs> for twelve hundred dollars, you can ensconce yourself in this wool pullover that is hideous. It is patchwork. There is a Yankee hat on one sleeve. There is a baseball with a a baseball glove with a baseball on another patch. There is, I'm assuming this is supposed to be the Statue of Liberty, but it looks like it's a silhouette of Medusa raising her hand like she knows the answer (laughs) in elementary school. It is hideous, but it can be yours for twelve hundred. But if that's a little too rich for your blood, that's okay. They've got a bunch of other sweaters here for about five hundred bucks if you want. Oh, so half off. Much more affordable for the average fan. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, are they cashmere? And do they have a red dot? <laughs> Let's see. A button up cardigan. This is the only one that tells me what fabric it's made out of. Here's a, oh, and this one says men's Yankee pullover. Yet a woman is obviously modeling it in all of the pictures. Okay. So it sounds like they might be unisex. So this is, this is, oh boy, there's some ugly things. Do you want a brown knit V-neck pullover with a Yankee logo on it? Me? No. (laughs) No, I don't think anybody does. Although it says almost gone. I think that's hyperbole myself. Uh, Yes, and it's (laughs) almost free too. (laughs) Well, no, this isn't a Ralph Lauren. This one's only $65. Oh, it is almost free. Yeah, (laughs) that's Still way overpriced. But let's talk about the World Series, actually, first of all here. Um, Games two and three were pretty boring. Uh, Game four last night was pretty boring until about midway through. But what about game one? Oh, my gosh. Game one was incredible. Oh, that was a classic for the ages. It was one of the better games I've seen all season. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I enjoyed watching that game so much. And I was cheering, even though I don't have a rooting interest in either teams. It was just baseball. It was awesome. It was a great game. Freddie Freeman with that home run. Uh, it's incredible. And I'm not sure. I, well, I'm guessing a lot of our listeners have seen this. But he hit that at 837 Pacific time. He hit that that home run, that walk off home run. Eight thirty seven is the exact time in the Pacific time zone that Kurt Gibson hit his walk off home run in Game One of the eighty eight World Series off of Dennis Eckersley. That's amazing. Uh, Thirty six years later, now Joe, I, what's his name? The guy that's doing the play by play now for Fox, Joe Davis, I think is the name. I don't even remember his name, (laughs) but uh, he did a nice little uh, shout out to Vin Scully when this was hit, which is incredible that he had the foresight and the ability to do that in the moment. But somebody put together this great, uh, great quick clip. It's it's a video clip, but you can hear the audio, which is probably the most important. It's just showing the two home runs, the two walk off home runs at the same time. As the overs. So they kind of spliced it together there. The catchphrase there was lined up and they were both saying it at the same time, which is just That's really cool. There is even a picture of the of the uh, Dodger Stadium scoreboard that shows exactly it is the same time when both home runs were hit. That's pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Uh, I wonder what happened in that in that 88 World Series. How'd that how'd that end up? I don't remember. I, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. Well, let's talk about the Dodgers for a minute. Their uh, AAA club is in Oklahoma City. They're going to change their name for this upcoming season. And this time, not just for one food-related name change during the day. Or they're not going to be called the Oat Milk whatever like everybody else. It will be the fifth name for this club overall. In the past, they've gone by the 89ers, the Red Hawks, the Dodgers. That's really original. And then last year, they were just the uh, Oklahoma City Baseball Club. But this upcoming season, they are going to be the OK... Well, the OK. I, I'm cool with Oklahoma City. I just call it OK City. They're, they're going to be the Oklahoma City Comets in honor of Oklahoma native Mickey Mantle, a.k.a. the Commerce Comet. Oh, nice. OK. OK. I like the, that. The Dodgers are going to name themselves after the most second most famous Yankee of all time. That's right. <laughs> it's kind of- it's kind of kind of odd, but yeah, I, I get the correlation. There's a statue apparently of Mickey Mantle outside the stadium, <laughs> probably with a nondescript uh, hat, yeah. <laughs> or he's wearing like an a hat that just says Oklahoma on it, like you get at the <laughs> airport. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Let's uh, have you noticed this? What the players are wearing, especially in New York, because it's been chilly there. The uh, turtlenecks and the mock turtlenecks. Yep, yep. I did notice that. I love it. Oh. 
that's I mean, that's such a great look from the 80s. Well, not the 80s, probably the the 90s and the early 2000s. I always just Greg Maddox always had it. Chipper yeah. Jones wore one, whether it was warm or not. He just cut the yep. sleeves off if it was warm. But multiple Yankees have opted for this old school look that is just great. Turns out that those turtlenecks are not just a nod to the past. They are actually from the past. They've been in storage for all these years. Players came across it and get this. They chose them. They like them better because of the fabric. And that fabric, of course, is cotton. Luis Polonia, cotton is king. Well, if Luis Polonia says it, we know... That's the only that's the only way Luis Polonia gets mentioned on this show is if he's being quoted about his cotton uniform. Yeah, that's that's amazing. That the fact that they kept it in storage that long. You think that was in Newman's uh, storage facility? <laughs> With, let's see some managerial news. The Chicago White Sox have named a new manager, the 44th in club history, and that is Will Venable. I remember Will Venable, outfielder. I couldn't have probably told you any teams that he played for. He played for nine years in the big leagues, eight with the Padres, and then uh, split parts of the seasons with the Dodgers and the Rangers at the end of his career. But he was he played every position in the outfield. Overall, a career 249 hitter, 315 on base, 81 home runs, 307 RBI, 135 stolen bases. He had... Four years in a row of 20 plus stolen bases and was never caught more than seven times. So he had good speed. Man, I guess. Overall, a career war of 13. But he is the new new manager for the Chicago White Sox. So I guess good luck to him. Uh, By the way, Will Venable has the most Major League Baseball career hits and home runs of any Princeton alumnus. And he is also the first African-American player from Princeton to make the the big leagues and thusly be the first African-American manager from Princeton in the big leagues. I don't know. I'm I'm guessing there, but I think I'm pretty confident. The player that he passed to become the career leader in hits and home runs from Princeton, he passed Mo Berg, catcher, spy. I don't I've seen like half of the godfather i don't know oh that's mo green oh i thought he owned the bar in the simpsons no yeah, i've got it all confused man. yeah whatever i'm thinking of mo berg the catcher slash spy yeah I, I know that's the I, one i'm thinking of but. i'm trying to throw in a godfather reference to make myself seem like i know what i'm talking about when i talk about movies okay and then this one brian Krauss, longtime lister sent us this that people named the sexiest podcast hosts of 2024. Mark, we did not make the list. Oh, come on. Again? (laughs) The Kelsey brothers have been named people's sexiest podcast hosts of 2024. Um, Well, they've got kind of an advantage on us. (laughs) That they're sexy? They're better looking. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) uh, All right. That's going to do it for the BP segment here. Let us... Get right into it. We're past the postseason. We are eliminated, so we don't need the grounds crew to do anything. So let's just get right into it. Mark, you and I love mascots. Oh, oh yes, of course. Yeah, I, just figured you I thought you were just telling me. You didn't need to respond because everybody knows that we love mascots. Well, let's talk about the best one. The one that I actually enjoy. And you brought up some stuff, so I thought, oh, well, let's just, let us let me do some background on this, and then I know you've got a story or two about it. Let's talk about the Philly Fanatic. I mean, how many other baseball podcasts right now in the middle of the World Series are talking about mascots, especially of a team that are not in the World Series? <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Well, <laughs> we, we got to stay on brand. Got to stay on brown. So let, let's talk about, I've got some some color here on, on the Fanatic before we get into his shenanigans. First of all, before the Fanatic, there was, I mean, the Phillies have been around for a long time. So they did have other mascots. The ones that preceded the Fanatic was Philadelphia Phil and Philadelphia Phyllis. <laughs> yeah, I, I like those already. Yeah, well, when you see a picture of them, you won't. Oh, uh, these two mascots were colonial era dolls. 
Wow. So if you saw the two of them at a game today, you would expect them to be racing each other between the innings, all of the president's race in at, at the Nats or the sausage race in Milwaukee, you know, that kind of thing. Think of a dot race, but on the field. And the best way I can really describe them is they kind of look like human bobbleheads because there's just from the neck down, it's just a person wearing knickerbockers or whatever those are called and the big buckles on the, the shoes and that. You just think of Ben Franklin, how you think of him dressing. These two were dressed like that, except for they had huge heads. But they looked like wee blows on the heads like they were mascots just, are supposed to have all, all supposed to have huge heads, I think. Maybe. Well, well there, there are a couple that deviate, like the one we're talking about today. Oh, yeah. Well, well, he's still got a big head, but compared to his body, it's smaller. Right. But So the Philly Fanatic was first unveiled to the public April 25th, 1978. And it was a very unassuming debut, namely the fact that the Phillies did not announce to anybody that they were introducing a new mascot before this. That's some that's some really good marketing. Yeah. Well, in contrast to this, the San Diego chicken who had like a grand he hatched from an egg, didn't he? That's yes, how they introduced did. him. It was a big thing. I mean, you see it on this week in baseball. You still see it on just random things. This you could have just showed up by this April 25th game. And I can just see the PA announcer before the game. Yeah. To make sure to get your popcorn. If you look down the right field line, here's our new mascot. And don't forget uh, to come back tomorrow. Like it was yeah. completely nondescript. Definite look change for the Philly, Philly fanatic versus Philadelphia Phil and Phyllis. And this was created by Bonnie Erickson who had worked with Jim Henson on creating the Muppets. As a matter of fact, she helped design Miss Piggy as well as Stadler and Waldorf. Wow. So those are some, I mean, those are three of the Muppets that are in like the top 10 of Muppets that every single person knows, right? Yeah, who knew there was a correlation? Also, she had her hand in, in creating Yuppie. Okay. Who was the Expos mascot, and uh, you're going to tell us about here shortly, also had a run-in with some players and specific managers. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, not to be left out, the Hiroshima Carp, their mascot, who has a slight resemblance to the Fanatic, was also designed by Bonnie Erickson. So she she's like the go-to for mascots in the big leagues. Bonnie Erickson. I guess so. Not to be confused with Scott Erickson, which right, no, totally do. different family. Totally different. So, on a fanatic baseball card, this would be the fun fact on the back, and that is that his jersey features a five-pointed star. Okay, why? Because that's the Philly Fanatics' favorite shape. Okay, there you have it. <laughs> Just think if players could put their favorite shape on the back <laughs> instead of a number. I'm a big dodecahedron guy myself. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. But, how about like the shape of Betty Boop or something? Would that work? Oh, I, it's a shape, isn't it? Yeah. I always thought Philadelphia's favorite shape was the middle finger, though. Just like a silhouette <laughs> of the middle finger. It would be up there, I think. Yeah. I think you're right. Probably right after the five pointed star. I, I digress. So the Philly Fanatic canonically. I know I still said that wrong, despite the fact I'm going to edit out the previous attempts of me trying to say that word. But in the Philly fanatic lure, he hails from the Galapagos Islands. Oh, wow. Now, I did not know that. No word on how he got to Philadelphia. Maybe it's a species migration pattern of whatever species the fanatic is. Galapagos to Philly. What is the singular of species? Species? Spe well, species is a species. singular. It's migration. A, no, it's a singular. It's one of those weird words. It's why English is so easy to learn. But I, I guarantee what's going to happen is there's some ornithologist that's going to be listening to this show, and they're going to send us a note that says, the lily-footed titterbeak actually does migrate from the Galapagos to Pennsylvania every year. Now, Jeff, that'll never happen. You know why? Because nobody listens to the show. <laughs> We're big in the <laughs> ornithologist circles, I've heard. Oh, no kidding. You, you know, we, we keep keep, keep bleh, we keep getting mentioned on whiskey podcast list, Red yes. Sox history podcast list. You would be surprised on how many ornithologist podcast lists we get mentioned on. It's or uncanny. will be will be now is probably gonna happen. <laughs> yes, yeah, so ornithology neither uh 
a habit uh, or, or something that either of us have picked up in any capacity, but we like to say the word ornithology. Ornithologist. That's a fun word to say. So it's, it is a uh, fanatic family. He's got a mom. Her name's Phoebe fanatic. Occasionally appears on field with the fanatic. He also has a younger cousin, Fred spelled P H R E D. Okay. Very common spelling. He's got a girlfriend, Fiona. P H I O N A. I I don't know what species the fanatic is, but it seems to me that they're part of the species uh, is that you have to have your name start with a PH. Sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, no mention though. I could not find any mention of what happened to Philadelphia Phil or Phyllis. So I'm just assuming that the fanatic had to eat them to assert dominance and become the new mascot. We could have gone with retirement, but oh, nope. I'll stick with. Nope. This is, you wonder where he got that big belly from? He <laughs> ate Philadelphia Phil and Phyllis. That's, and that is canati- can- canonically. I cannot say that word. You got it right. Canonically. Well, there it is. It's, it's canon now because it's been mentioned on a podcast. Yeah. It's on the internet. It has to be true. Yep. All right. So let's get into some specifics here. So the Philly fanatic is. One, he's just funny. The Philly fanatic has always been one of those entertaining mascots to me. He can make his big belly go around or he could push it out at people. He's got that that snout with one of those things that you had at a birthday party where you blow and it like unrolls out as a tongue, which is good comedy. He loves to put popcorn tubs on people, dump them on them including a lot of broadcasters. He's been known to go up in the booth and bring people popcorn and then just dump it on them. But also, I saw a video. I don't know why the Yankees were playing the Phillies because this was a long time ago. For some reason, George Steinbrenner was at a Yankees-Phillies game in Philadelphia, and the Fanatic went up and had a huge tub of popcorn, and he looked at George, and he instead dumped it on George's driver next to him. And not George. <laughs> that would have been risky to dump it on George risky, Steinbrenner. Risky, but viral. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, was, I was rooting for him to do it, but he, he did not. He also likes to ride that four-wheel bike around on the surface before the game, which I don't think was a problem at the, at the old stadium because it was turf. But now that you've got grass there, I think he's got to probably be careful that he doesn't like tear up the grass. And I'm sure with the ATV. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure the grounds crew loves it. But one of the things that players like to do is they like to steal his keys to the, to the four wheeler. And I saw some videos of players working in concert and like going and getting his attention and pretending to goof around with him so that he turns his back. And then another teammate goes and either jumps on the bike and takes off on it or steals the keys and runs away. So, OK. Well, that's sneaky. He he can he can give it out, but he likes to he'll take it as well. A uh, one game in particular, 1982. Lonnie Smith, he was with the Cardinals at this point. The fanatic was taunting him during the game. Like during the game from above the dugout or whatever, but he came on the field in between innings to do something. And Lonnie was running in from his position in the outfield and the fanatic was near him and he actually tackled the the fanatic out of frustration. Wow. Yeah. Now I'm wondering if anybody on the Phillies, did they try to stop him? Like hold me back or did the bullpens empty or anything? I'm guessing everyone thought it was just funny, but he said that it was not out of, he was not joking. He was legitimately frustrated and the fanatic was his release. But (laughs) now not just players though. And I think one manager that we've covered quite a bit here, we had a whole episode on him. We referenced him many times. Had a couple of run-ins with the Fanatic, Mark. Yeah, we're talking about uh, Dodgers skipper Tommy Lasorda, of course. And you, if you haven't seen the footage of Lasorda's run-in with the Fanatic, just look it up, YouTube, Google, whatever you got. It's out there. The Fanatic used to love to make fun of Lasorda. And he would come out there with, uh, you know, shoving his belly out in front of him and dancing around in front of him. and Or he'd bring out like a, a portly mannequin with a Lasorda jersey on it. He always ended up getting Tommy Lasorda's extra jersey. And Lasorda couldn't figure it out for the longest time. The Fanatic had an inside source on the Dodgers to get that jersey every time. And and do you want to guess who that is? 
Well, I know who it is. Well, then don't guess. <laughs> I'll just tell everyone. <laughs> the one and only Steve Sachs, which it fits his personality. You know, he would go when, when Tommy wasn't around and get the extra uniform, get it to the fanatic, and the fanatic would dress whatever up in, in Lasorda's uniform and then make fun of it and beat it up and all that fun stuff. Tommy was never that amused by it, but he, you know, Tommy gets it. He So he just kind of let it happen. But, well, one day, August 28th, 1988, okay, so the, the Dodgers are visiting Philadelphia. Lasorda uh, is actually from Norristown, PA. He always had friends and family in the stands and so on. Took players back to Norristown meet, to meet his family, stuff like that. I'm sure they had lots of Italian sausage and lasagna and all that fun stuff, as Lasorda used to talk about all the time. Anyway, so this one day, Lasorda decides he's not going to let the fanatic get a hold of his extra uniform. So he hides it. And he then tells the clubhouse guys that if if – the fanatic gets a hold of his extra uniform. Somebody's going to get fired. Okay. So he was really adamant about this. So the, the fanatic or the gentleman that plays the fanatic, are we allowed to say his name? Yes. Well, yeah, no, Raymond. you're not. He says that he is the fanatic's best friend. The fanatic's it's, best they friend. Gotta, they keep kayfabe up very well. Yeah, in Philadelphia. That's right. The fanatic's best friend, Dave Raymond was in charge of getting the uniform apparently from sax. Uh, sax couldn't find it. No one could. So in order to pull off his stunt he wanted to do, Dave had to go and find a Dodgers visiting uniform somewhere in Philadelphia, you know. So good luck with that. Somehow he did. He got a hold of it. He had a friend embroider Lasorda's name and number on the back of the jersey, and he put it on a, a like a chubby dummy type thing and wrote his ATV out and and started, you know, messing with Lasorda out in front. Lasorda was not happy, probably because he, well, for whatever reason, I read that it was because of an uh, anti-pasta diet he was on. But for whatever reason, he was going through pasta withdrawals. He was, he was grumpy. It was something like that. Yeah. That's what I read. But anyway, he, he really didn't want this to happen this time. And so he was really upset. And if you, this is where the, the camera picks it up. The sort of heads out there when, and the fanatics a little more svelte, a little quicker than Tommy and he's avoiding him. Tommy goes up and he grabs the ATV and he takes it and he pushes it far away. So he's got the fanatic one-on-one and he goes after him and, and the fanatic falls. Tommy grabs the faux Tommy Lasorda and picks it up and smacks the Philly fanatic one time with it and storms off carrying the fake Lasorda. It's funny because Tommy said when asked about it, he said, how dare they disrespect the Dodger uniform? If he wants to entertain, dance, carry kids around, that's great. But I don't believe in demonstrating violence at the ballpark, and that's what he does with the dummy. So Tommy was just anti-violence, the whole reason behind it, apparently. But uh, it it was not a one-time thing for Tommy, just I mean, we're getting off of, off of the fanatic here a little bit, but for Tommy, it was a one, not a one-time thing. He actually got into an issue with the aforementioned Yuppie. And, and make and sure so, you say that. It, there's an exclamation point at the end of Yuppie. It's Yuppie! It's officially in his name. There's an I at the end, which is an upside-down exclamation point, and then right next to it, there's got to be a exclamation point. Yuppie! Sorry. Okay, Yuppie! All right. So <laughs> I got a gatekeep, a team mascot that is no longer, <laughs> no longer. Yeah. Yuppie. Not around anymore, but uh, except in our hearts. And um, probably in a storage room somewhere in Montreal. The Daily News columnist in Philly, Stan Hockman, referred to both of them as babies for their little spat there. Raymond, the, the, the Philly Fanatics best friend, said, I'm a professional idiot. How can you call me a baby? Tommy Lasorda is the manager of the Dodgers, and he's fighting a Muppet. So, (laughs) with a good point right there. The next day, Raymond had a plate of veal scallopini delivered to Tommy in the manager's office. And I was forgiven. And uh, kind of a funny thing, a team of all-stars went on a tour of Japan in the offseason that year, and Lasorda was managing the teams, the team, and the Fanatic went along. Oh, boy. And, uh, yeah, Lasorda and uh, Raymond, the Fanatic's best friend, 
forged actually forged a really good friendship and just talking late at night. The sort of knew Raymond's father, who was a uh, head football coach at the University of Delaware. They they knew each other through some sports circles, and uh, they actually became pretty doggone good friends. Even though Lasorda did write in his 2015 biography, My Way, what, what a unique name, he said, I hate the Philly fanatic. In fact, I'm not very happy about mascots in general. So there was a little animosity, I think, for the fanatic, but n- maybe not so much for, for Raymond, okay? It was a, a tenuous relationship, but they became good buddies. And I'll close out this little part of the story with this. Raymond said after Tommy passed away, he was one of the last vestiges of someone that's disappearing in baseball, personality, characters. He inspired passion and love for the game in people. He brought fun to the game, and I cherish him for that. I I have to nod in agreement with the fanatic uh, about that whole thing, but uh, the whole incident is hilarious. Uh, Don Drysdale, I believe, was uh, announcing, and he he's laughing his butt off while he's talking about what's going on out there. Now, I remember when this happened in 1988, you said, right? Yes, yes. I think I, I remember hearing at the time that Tommy, I think kind of goes along with what you said. You said an anti-pasta diet, but yes. I believe he was pushing slim fast at that point. And ah. he did lose weight with Slim Fast and he did a bunch of national commercials. And I get the feeling that this was probably early on in the Slim Fast where he was not happy being on a diet. So anything was going <laughs> to set him off. Yeah, this is true. And and interestingly, because of the Slim Fast Association, the fanatic used to bring Slim Fast out onto the field with him to make fun of Tommy. <laughs> An actual little can of Slim Fast, stuff like that. Uh, I got a couple of other pop culture things here that the fanatic. Now, obviously, the fanatic doesn't speak. He speaks through his best friend every now and then. But you never see them in the same room together, which is odd. Yeah, that's weird, isn't it? But, yeah, I'm going to let it go. For uh, friends? You know, you would. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> for best friends. You know? Yeah. <laughs> You'd think you'd get him a ticket to a Philly game or something. But, no. I never see them together. The fanatic appeared on an episode of the uh, PBS show. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Wow. I, can you sing the theme song to that? I can, but I'm not going to. Oh yeah. We don't want to get a copyright. No. Struck. Yeah. We get only Trevor that. Bauer does that though, but that's right. Apparently so. Uh, Him let's and see. His huge band. Uh, the, uh, one of the remake, not the remakes, but the reboots, Rocky Balboa that came out in 2006. Apparently the fanatic is in the closing credits of that movie. I don't remember. Huh. I'm okay. Philadelphia. I get it. Yeah. I, oh, I totally get it. Uh, also let's see January 26, 2012, the fanatic appeared on an episode of 30 rock. Also on an episode in 2015 of the Goldbergs, which makes sense that took place in Philadelphia. There's a bunch of Philly stuff going on there. And then he was also inducted. He was a charter member in the mascot hall of fame in 2005. So as he should be like Cy Young, Babe Ruth, like the first class. Do they have an, an eras committee or anything? What was the what was that Yankees mascot that was around for like a game? Oh man, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That looked kind of like know. a super hairy Thurman Munson. I think uh, that was Dandy. his name, Super Harry. Yeah, that was his name, Dandy. <laughs> it looks like somebody. He just looks like a white Muppet that got spray painted pinstripes <laughs> on the way to the stadium. <laughs> like some gang tagged him on the way to the stadium. In 1981. But like, is is there, do they vote for guys like Dandy that might have fallen off the mascot Hall of Fame ballot? <laughs> probably not. Probably, You're, probably not. not. <laughs> All right. That's going to do it for the Philadelphia Phillies mascot. It would have been great if the Phillies would have made the World Series. This would have been much more topical. Yeah, absolutely. But we, we did definitely had to get to a point where we would give the fanatic uh, his due. Yeah, and we kind of do what we want here. I don't know if anybody's noticed. <laughs> <laughs> until somebody pays us to do otherwise, yeah. we do what we want. If someone wants to pay us and tell us, you need to do something on the Yankees and Dodgers. Uh, well, we did. We talked about we talked about New York Yankee sweaters. By the way, you can get a New York Yankees polo Lauf, Lauf Roran. 
<laughs> if you've got dyslexia, <laughs> like I'm like myself, Polo Ralph Lauren Green Cooperstown Collection Pullover Sweater, which is a $400 pullover sweater it's got the yankee logo over the heart but the sweater is green now we've talked about the the history of the new york yankees a lot and not once has green been a color i don't even think they didn't even wear green hats on saint patrick's day like everybody used to do i don't think during spring training i don't think so either but in the same capacity he's ralph loren he can do what he wants All right, that's going to do it for the main segment of the show, and that means that we are now going to turn our attention to the final segment in which Mark and I engage in some hardcore 1v1 combat using baseball cards. So before we get into the rules and such, let's hear this song. All right, so this is Wax Packs Heroes. If we look at the scoreboard right now, I am way out in front. The score is 11 to 7. We are, we're not resting. And we've had a time on, you know, we had Dawn on last week, Dawn August, and I gave my guys the, the week off. It was a bullpen game before that when you finally won a game. So we're rested and ready to go. I got my A squad out there and ready to go. It's 11 to 7. We're playing first to 20. If you're new here or if you just want a refresher, this is what we're going to do. We're going to open up some baseball cards from the Wax Pack era generally, and we're going to take one for me, one for Mark. We're going to go head to head. What we're going to do is we're going to take the baseball reference war of the player on the card and use the year of the card for that war. And whoever's got the highest one wins that round. First one to five wins that game. But there are some rules that can add or subtract to that war total. First of all, anything that we call 80s baseball aesthetics That means primarily real stirrups, because we like that. you got to be able to see some sanitary socks. Uh, If you've got a mustache, that's great. Anything kind of facial hair related, you're going to get an extra tenth of a point as well. But if it's a really good one, like if it's a handlebar or it's just super thick, like if it covers that lower lip so we can't see that or you can't see up their nostrils because it's so thick, that's an extra tenth of a point. Glasses, whether they be science teacher glasses so that they can see the ball or flip down sunglasses, sunglasses of any type, even if they're on the hat, we're going to count them all. Eye black. Those are all a tenth of a point. But if they're wearing something like two and ones or they're wearing high tops and showing stirrups, that's going to be a minus a tenth of a point. If they won an award, meaning rookie of the year, Cy Young MVP, were an all-star or won a gold glove that year, that's a half a point. If there's a Hall of Famer on the card, whether they're the focus or not, that's a whole point because they're a Hall of Famer. And if Ricky Henderson shows up, doesn't matter whose card it is. I'm going to win that round automatically. If Nolan Ryan shows up, Mark wins that round automatically. And any pop culture references that we can easily find are half a point, unless they appeared on Seinfeld, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, or The Simpsons, in which you get a whole point for each of those shows. And if they showed up in the Mitchell Report or were suspended for doing bad things during the regular season or postseason, that's a minus half a point as well. So, Mark, you've got some cards for us this week. What year are we looking at? We're looking at 1990 tops. This will be the end of the blister pack of 100 that uh, was given to us by a guy who claims to be my brother, Tim. He gave us 100 cards? It was one blister pack with 100 cards. Wow. And we've gone through them all. Yes, Okay. Are you sure you haven't just kept some of them for yourself? Like the like the Greg Jeffries? Yeah, like the Greg Jeffries. There's Sam Horn in there. You're hoping to cash yeah, in on that. Big but, Sam Horn. Okay. Yeah, let's but, get it right. All right. So uh we're gonna do nineteen ninety is gonna be the year that we look at the war. And let's get started, Mark. I bet you're going with the left team. I am. All right. Well, this could be a battle, actually. I'm seeing the the what this matchup is. And it's a good pitcher, hitter power against power kind of matchup you have it's actually doubles leaders card and they have the third place in doubles all-star third baseman howard johnson so did they put out multiple doubles leaders i you wouldn't I typically so. highlight the number three guy right because they got pedro guerrero <laughs> with 42 tim wallach with 42 and hojo with 41 all right so sandwiched in between two all-star seasons for hojo 
and he had some great seasons. But 1990, appeared in 154 games, hit 244, 319 on base, 23 home runs, 90 RBI, and a 106 OPS plus. The next season, he led the league in both home runs and RBI. And sacrifice flies. Wow. But I don't get that. In 1990, though, he is good for a war of 2.4. Now, I am guessing he has got some facial hair, though. Um, Yeah, he definitely has got some facial hair going on. He's always got that facial. Usually a beard. Full beard. Let's see here. Uh, Hojo, of course, 1986, he was on the Mets. That's a good thing if you're uh, looking to win a World Series. But... Uh, What you might forget about is he was also on the 1984 Tigers who won the World Series. So he's got two Mm -hmm. World Series rings. Not a great hitter in the World Series. I'm just going to say that he only had six plate appearances overall, and he went 0 for 6 with two strikeouts. Yeah, bummer. But he played pretty much anywhere you needed him. The only positions I don't see here are catcher and pitcher easy guy to slide in anywhere in the order also drafted number one 12th pick overall by the tigers in 1974 and the tigers traded him to the mets for walt terrell that the walt terrell yes (laughs) the yes yeah so let's see overall that's a 2.5 let's see if i feel like he should have some i don't think he was in mets merized so uh, nothing here that's easy to find. So I'm going to have a 2.5 to start out with. Well, I, I hate to tell you this, but he's got fake stirrups on. So I've got a 2.4 here. All but right. you're going to be okay with that because my guy also has fake stirrups on. Well, well, let's see what else he's got. All right. All right. Uh, up for me, I'm facing Hojo. 1989 AL earned run average leader with a 2.16 earned run average, Brett Saberhagen. Mm. See, we already know that regardless of uh, stirrups, that he's going to get big pop culture points for his yes. incredible musical performance that set the world on fire and moved those Ford trucks. That's right. Let's see, Sabes, two-time Cy Young Award winner, 1985, who's... World Series winning team, and of course, two Cy Youngs in 85 and 89. 1990, also for you, he was an all-star overall, a record of 5-9, and nine, only Ooh. 20 games, a 135 innings pitched, 146 innings hits allowed, excuse me, 87 strikeouts and a 118 ERA+. Plus. And that is a war of 3.6, so we don't need to go any further. You have won that round. Uh, Saberhagen was unmarried with children as well. I thought I thought you said he was unmarried with children, but no, you said <laughs> on. No, he was married. It's all good. All right, you're up one to nothing. Okay, and now for you, you have catcher for the Cleveland baseball team, Andy Allenson. Mm. We've had him before, apparently. The bad news for me, well, depending on what your card is, is that uh, he did not appear in the major leagues in 1990. Let's see. Well, then I may have you. Yeah. (laughs) He played in the minors. I don't know if he was rehabbing late or whatever, but overall, eight years in the big leagues, Cleveland for four, and then the Angels, Giants, Tigers, and Brewers. Overall, he had a career war of 0.8, so I wouldn't have been expecting a whole lot had he actually played and i'm gonna guess there's not a lot of pop culture related to andy allenson i'm not seeing any yeah, yeah. all right so uh anything on the card gonna help me uh no no I he's black, got catcher's mustache. Gear on, so you can't tell if he's got stirrups and he is clean shaven all right well suck it andy allenson well and he's got the the no eared helmet but i mean that's his catcher's gear i think i may have you here all-star first baseman for the blue jays Fred McGriff. Well, yeah, you get the Hall of Fame, you get the crime dog, you get the the commercial. I mean, this isn't even going to be, this isn't even going to be close. Let's see. Overall, 19 years in the big leagues. Name a team he probably played for him. 1990, no awards that year for him. But let's see, 153 games, a 300 average, a 400 on base percentage. Wow. Uh, 35 home runs, 88 RBI, and a 153 OPS plus. And uh, that is good for a war of 5.2. Oh, uh, boy. 
Yeah. We've covered him quite a few times. Involved in a lot of trades, Hall of Fame, just a bunch of stuff. But uh, this is going to be a, a no doubter for you as well. I, I, I feel like I've thrown two pitches and you've hit them both out of the, not just the, not just home runs, but out of the park. Yeah, it's uh, been good so far for All right. me. You know. Yeah. All right, you ready? Yep. You, you get a Blue Jay this time. Not quite as good as McGriff, but definitely a long career. Ed Sprague. Ernie Witt. Oh. That's your Ernie Witt. Yeah, that's not going to get me a lot. <laughs> Catchers like Ernie Witt stick around for a long time, but they're not going to get, he's durable, but he's not. He did his 15 home runs a year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. Uh, he's a 38-year-old catcher at this point. So <laughs> <laughs> he's uh, in Atlanta. Uh, let's see. Uh, 67 games, a 172 batting average, a 265 on base, two home runs, 10 RBI, and a 40 OPS plus. And that is a war of minus 1.2. <laughs> Ooh, wow. Yeah, uh, I know he hated Ricky Henderson, especially in the playoffs, because one time, I remember it was in the ALCS, and I it, it was 89, and it was in Oakland, and Ricky was just running wild during that ALCS, and I remember he stole second, and Witt didn't even throw down because he'd stolen it so easy, so Ricky didn't slide, and Witt didn't like that. Uh-huh. I'm on yes. Ricky's side here. If you don't want, if you want him, that. if you want him to slide, throw the ball. Otherwise, shut your pie hole back there. I am going to guess there's no pop culture that we know of. Now, I can see him doing some local commercials up in Canada for Pizza Shack or Boston Pizza, whatever the heck they have up there. But I can't find it. So, Well, this isn't pop culture, but just something cool about him. He, uh, he He manages the Canada National Baseball Team. Now, he has been inducted in the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. Do I get points for that? Well, you have to do the, the exchange uh, rate. Yeah, exchange yeah. rate. So it's like fourteen cents. <laughs> uh, anything on the card can help me out. Mustache. One mustache for you. One mustache, as opposed to two, I guess. That's yes. I, I'll get already odd. up a mustache. Um. Uh, yeah. Nothing else though. Nope. All right. This isn't even going to be close. Who you got? <laughs> well, this, this is kind of a, a goocher here. You got Ernie Witt, and I have Mike Witt. Mike Witt. With no. You have Witt and I have Witt. Let's see. Mike Witt, overall, 12 years in the big league, 10 with California, and then three to end it out with the Yankees. 1990, he split time between California and the Yankees. Overall, went 5-9 and nine with a 4.0 ERA, 117 innings pitched, 106 hits, 74 strikeouts, a 99 ERA plus. And that is going to be good for a war of 0.5. <laughs> which is going to be good enough. Yeah, that's going to be more than more than enough. Anything else on that card going to help you out? Mike is a clean-shaven guy, and uh, no, I can't tell about no. the stirrups, so no. Oh, he was traded from California to the Yankees for Dave Winfield. Oh, wow. So, big name there. Let's see, Mike Witt elsewhere. Oh, he met his wife, Lisa, who worked for the Angels Group Sales Department his rookie year. Okay. Oh, nice. And uh, now he did throw a perfect game on the last day of the season. Yes, he did. In uh, what year was that? Oh, 1990. And, you know, of course, if if you're going to throw a no hitter, it's going to be against the Mariners. Well, yeah. He also combined a no hitter with Mark Langston against the Mariners. (laughs) He is the only player ever to throw a complete game no hitter and appear in relief for a combined no hitter. He must have just like mouth watering when he sees the Mariners on the schedule. All right, so there's another easy win for you. <laughs> yeah, it's three oh. What's three going to on, nothing. man? All right, next card. All right, you got Cardinals pitcher Ken Daly. I am uh, not really pulling the big names here, am I? Not really, no. All right, let's see. Ken Daly with two Y's. Eleven years in the big leagues. Seven with St. Louis. Three with Atlanta. Two with Toronto. 1990. With St. Louis, he went 4-4 four and four with a 3.56 ERA, 73 innings pitched, 63 hits allowed, 51 strikeouts, a 107 ERA plus, and that is good for a war of .3. Anything else can okay. help me out on that card? Check the stirrups. You can't really tell. 
if they're mm-hmm. real or fake. All it's right. kind of a weird angle. And clean shaven, so no, nothing, nothing going. All right. Uh, first round draft pick, third overall by Atlanta in 1980. Yeah, there is. It's a very short Wikipedia page for Ken Daly. Not uh, not much going on there. So uh, you got to beat a point three. Okay, well, can I do it with Phillies? And we talked about the Phillies a lot. This could be a goocher. Phillies shortstop Dickie Thon. Now, what is a goocher? I don't know, but they say it in the movie Stand By Me. All right. There's a coincidence. It's a goocher. Okay. Uh, Dickie Thon, of course, probably most famous, unfortunately, for being hit in the face. Yeah, being. Yeah, and that did not help his career, obviously. is. One would suspect that that usually is not going to further your career getting hit in the face. Overall, 15 years, though, in the big leagues, seven with the Astros, three with the Phils, and the Angels, Rangers, Padres, and Brewers at different points. In 1990, with Philadelphia, appeared in 149 games, hit 255, 305 on base, eight home runs, 48 RBI, 12 stolen bases for an 81 OPS plus. And that is good for a war of 1.6. I'm going to guess he might even have a two-tenths of a point mustache. He's got a beauty. That's for sure. It's a two-tenser. Yeah. I mean, that's that's dicky. Nothing Uh, else is going to make a difference. Nothing else is going to make a difference there. Inducted into the Hispanic Heritage Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah, he's uh, from Puerto Rico, I believe. So uh, you will not get extra points for that, that uh, exchange rate. Well, I, I guess it's Puerto Rico. I guess it's they, they it's use US the dollar. Dollars, I believe <laughs> <laughs> the exchange rate being one for one. There you go. Uh, brother Frankie Thon, also a player, a manager, and a current major league scout. I've let you get comfortable here. It is yes. it's four to nothing. I'm ready to go. Let's bring it on. All right, you got one of my favorite players of all time, Seattle Mariners first baseman AD. Alvin Davis, Mr. Mariner. He only played for nine years. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, eight of which were with the Mariners. 1990, at the age of 29, appeared in 140 games, hit 283, 387 on base, 17 home runs, 68 RBI, and a 129 OPS plus. Was rookie of the year in 1984. Uh, let's see. Who yes, he was. Who did he beat out? He beat out, he beat out teammate Mark Langston and Kirby Puckett. Also beat out Roger Clemens. So some big names there that he he came out in front of. Uh, Seattle all, Mariners Hall of Famer. All of that leads to a 2.9 war. And I'm guessing he's got a mustache. Yeah, he's got a beauty. It's a it's definitely a nice two-pointer. Two right. tenths of a pointer. I will take that. Now, I, I don't want to throw shade at Alvin Davis, Mr. Mariner. But he was only in Seattle for eight years. And these numbers aren't that impressive. <laughs> is, is the bar just lower? Yeah, it was. He was really all we had. Yeah, up, I mean, until that point. I totally get it. Yeah, I mean, he was your, I would say your perennial all-star, but he was only an all-star his his rookie season. Yeah. I'm guessing because it, Mark Langston probably went to the all-star game every year as a Mariner and took his spot because the Mariners were sending only one player at that point, I'm sure. Is there anything else here that we can talk about? Garner, any, his niece is professional wrestler Candice LeRae. Yes, who I believe is um, the uh, WWE Women's Speed Champion. What is the, I don't know what speed wrestling is. WWE Speed is is a show, I believe. It's got their own champ. Okay. Yes. I don't think that's particularly worthy of... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's not well, she she actually was she's been in wwe nxt all that fun stuff but she's a current wrestler all right all right so i got a 3.1 to stay alive who you got i got another all-star card i got a lot of these all-star cards so that's a good thing funny how they all uh, ended up in your pile yeah isn't that odd yeah american league saves leader jeff russell 38 saves in 1989 so Let's check out his 1990 numbers. All right. Jeff Russell, 14 years in the big leagues, Texas for 10 of them, and then a couple of other teams. 1990 with Texas, he went one and five, but we know he's a closer. A 4.26 ERA and only 10 saves in 25 Hmm. innings. He was clearly hurt. 25 innings, 23 hits, 16 strikeouts, a 93 ERA plus. 
Hold on. Overall, that is a war of a negative 0.4. Oi. I'm I, now. I don't want to get cocky here, but I'm going to put a point down for me on this round already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see. Jeff can't tell what the stirrups does have a, a point one mustache. Okay, I'll take that. Was traded to the uh, A's by the Rangers along with Ruben Sierra and Bobby Witt for Jose Canseco. Now that was in '92, so Canseco was still a pretty decent player but that's mm-hmm. a good haul i they think they were all except for maybe ruben unless the a's re-signed him they were all free agents at the end of the year so none yeah. of them stayed on the team other than ruben that's a that's a good list of players to be traded for no um, doubt let's see was once a roll aids relief pitcher of the year so hopefully he got that fireman's helmet or the, the one of the uh, names we came up with for that particular uh, the fireball award. Yes, the Fireball (laughs) Fireball Award is what they should bring it back as. Russell's Texas Rangers Hall of Fame plaque lists him as the busiest relief pitcher in Rangers history. How do you how do you determine who's the busiest? I don't know. Maybe he had a lot of hobbies. Maybe he kept a to do list in the uh, clubhouse so people could see everything he was doing. Yeah, he might have been wiping down the counters and all that stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I I don't don't, definitely the busiest. I don't buy that. All right. So I got a point. All right. Here you go with another catcher. Oh, great. Guy who played for a long time, Rick Cerrone. Okay. Well, we already know I get bonus points because he recorded a kick ass song, The Long yes, Road that. Home, isn't it? Yeah, I think. He's got one heck of a mustache. Oh, too. I like that. All right. Yeah. 18 years in the big leagues. We've covered Rick several times, many teams in 1990. Uh, he was 36, but he still had two seasons after this. For the Yankees, appeared in 49 games. He just bounced back and p- forth between New York and Boston most of his career. 49 games, 302, average 324 on base, two home runs, 11 RBI, and a 99 OPS plus. And that is good for a war of 0.9. What kind of mustache? Is it one or two? That's probably a one-pointer. All right. So that'll that'll get me up to one even. And the uh, fake stirrups, my friend. Uh, all right, thanks. We are going to give him the half a point for the uh, pop culture reference for the long road home. First round draft pick overall by Cleveland in 1975 was traded for one of our guys, John Lowenstein, at oh, one nice. point. Yes. Did a whole episode on him. Is there any other pop culture beyond, you know, a certified banger uh, of which a long run home is? I don't see anything else. That's going to do it. But uh, all right, I got a 1.4. Who you got? I've got a second baseman for the Rangers, Julio Franco. Fifth in the league in batting average, hitting 316 in 89. Mm, all right. But it's 90 that matters. Let's see, 23 years Ooh. in baseball. Uh, top teams, Cleveland and Atlanta. Those are who he spent most of the time with. Uh, overall, 1990, good news for you, all star year. Okay. Uh, 157 games, 296 average, 383 on base, 11 home runs, 69 RBI, 31 stolen bases. Wow. And a 121 OPS plus. I think you're going to put me on my misery here. That is good for a 6.8. Woo. War. He's played in, I think, every league probably ever oh, invented. Man. I think he probably even founded a couple of leagues. You're going to get bonus points because we did a whole episode on the Glenn Hubbard baseball card with the snake around his neck, right? There is uh, pictures of Julio Franco with a snake around his neck in full uniform on the field as well. So that's just cool. So we'll we'll give you that as well. But it doesn't matter. You come away with an easy win, five to one. And that looking at the scoreboard, it's now 11 to eight. Now I'm starting to get a little concerned. Not going to lie. Well, you know, we're, we we played way below our, our abilities for such a long time that it's about time things started coming out. All right. You know? Whatever. What yeah, whatever. Whatever. Whatever, exactly. <laughs> All right. That'll do it for Wax Packs Heroes. That's also going to do it for this episode. Hey, if you want more of us, we have got so many ways that you can do that at this point. I got a lot of free time right now. I've been doing a lot of stuff on YouTube. Uh, I got some new videos up there. I've got some shorts every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday where you can guess the classic baseball card. Make sure to check that out. Please, uh, f- you know, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. That'll help us out big time. Also, I've been 
starting to stream on Twitch uh, just once, twice a week, depending on my schedule. Typically, it's going to be like maybe Tuesdays and Fridays. It's just for like 40 minutes, 40 minutes, maybe an hour, just doing the Immaculate Grid MLB Walk Off, which is that new game that you can play as well. And just looking at anything baseball that might strike my fancy. You can join me live and chat with me or that'll go up on YouTube when that's done so you can watch it. It's a quick watch, basically just me talking and trying to not make a fool out of myself on the grid. So uh, you can do that a couple of times a week. Check that out. But uh, beyond that, if you would rather send uh, if you would rather send us a, a, a well thought out sentiment, you can do that. And Mark is the one that takes care of all that. The long road on that one. Uh, yeah, you can write to us at two strike noise. Spell it out. T-W-O strike noise at gmail.com. If there's one thing I can do well, it is talk about nothing. That's why we're two white guys uh, kind of getting older and have a podcast. So that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. But hey, thank everybody for joining us. Thank you for listening to us each week. And uh, you know what? Let's do it again. We'll see you next week on the next episode of Two Strike. Thank you all. God bless you. Have a great day.